Welcome to Lecture 9 of the American Revolution. In this last set of lectures, we will look at the, what's often called the American Revolutionary Settlement. Basically, you know, we've seen what happened with the revolution, how it affected different groups, but what did it mean for the immediate and long term for the United States? Those are the questions that we will explore. In looking at these questions, there couldn't be a more important subject than the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution, after all, in some ways, is the leading legacy of the Revolution. It's the frame of government that we still live in. And it's a subject that's hard to avoid what I have uh, declared the number one historical swear word, and that is inevitable. In many ways, it feels like the Constitution was inevitable. It's something that we take for granted, and you cer certainly see it in this image, the famous painting of the Constitutional Convention that hangs in the Capitol today. Uh, George Washington stares off into the future, and it seems like everything was just in the bag. And so I think because of the Constitution's success, it's hard for us to go back in time and actually think about what it was like before. But what I want to do is approach the Constitution as a problem, um, as a problem to be solved rather than as a crowning achievement of American history like it often is treated. Uh, one of my favorite examples of that is the historical documentary filmmaker Ken Burns. Uh, when Ken Burns speaks, he talks about America's three great contributions to world history, and they are baseball, jazz, and the Constitution. And, you know, it's something of a self-serving answer uh, because he has a film on each of those subjects, and he's not completely wrong. So, in doing this, we, of course, want to recognize the genius of the document. Uh, and part of that is actually looking at how it came together. So America had a frame of government before the Constitution. And of course, that was the Articles of Confederation. And one of the really difficult problems under the Articles that America faced was debt from the Revolutionary War. Uh, this slide shows uh, debt in its different forms uh, that America had. Uh, you see the national debt of 28 million pounds. The fact that they were still counting money in pounds, I think, shows uh, how new and, and relatively weak the country was. Uh, 10 million pounds in foreign debt. Uh, all the states, or most of the states, had debts, uh, especially uh, the, de the, the states in the, in the north. Uh, but some southern states did as well, including Virginia, which you see had over 4 million pounds. And there was a lot of private debt, a lot of bankruptcy. So basically, everybody was in debt. Now, we talked about debt in terms of the British Empire early in the course. Uh, debt's not so bad if you're able to maintain it, if you're able to keep up with the interest. But this was something that America was actually beginning to fail at and, and really struggle. And for this reason, a lot of scholars refer to this period of American history as the critical period, uh, the period in which it would you know, it would be clear whether this revolution would work or not. And so the Articles of Confederation get, a, I think, a lot of grief. Uh, if a historical document, you know, needed a hug, I think it would be the Articles of Confederation. So maybe we'll, we'll try to do that a little bit here. I'll start by uh, giving us the, the framer, the, the writer, you might say, of the Articles, and that's John Dickinson. It says a lot that Dickinson is never celebrated as the father of the Articles of Confederation, uh, you know, like Madison is celebrated as the father of the Constitution. It's not something that uh, he or really anybody wanted to take credit for. Uh, it was something in an organic uh, document. It emerged really uh, from the, the first and then second Continental Congress and followed the same basic principle of one state, one vote. Uh, it took a long time to actually be officially adopted. It took until 1781. And one reason for that is uh, the various states, uh, the original states, had claimed land going all the way, in some cases, uh, to the Pacific Ocean, even though, of course, the United States wasn't that big at this time. Uh, they had grandiose ambitions. And it really required the various states to give up uh, some of those land claims before other states would trust them enough to come into a permanent confederacy. So that happened in, in 1781. And maybe the most significant thing about the Articles I can say is that there's a very direct response to the parliamentary argument that Parliament was sovereign. And, and that argument was that the states 
we're, so we're sovereign. And we see this again with the image of Independence Hall, uh, again emphasizing that it was called the Pennsylvania State House. In the Articles of Confederation, after the first article just basically announces uh, what the document was, um, the second lays out this principle of parliament or of, of state sovereignty. Uh, and it's really critical. It said, each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right, which is not by this con confederation expressly delegated to the United States in Congress assembled. And so there weren't very many powers actually delegated to the United States in Congress. The states maintain most power. And so I think most people, when they teach about the Articles of Confederation, they emphasize uh, the document and the government that it formed as weak. And that's not completely wrong from a national level. Uh, most importantly, Congress could not raise a revenue. They could just follow that plan that we first saw way back in the Seven Years' War with William Pitt. They could just follow the plan of asking nicely of the various states and hoping that they would get money. So this is how that worked out. In 1781, Congress requested $3 million from the, from the states. They got about $39,000 in return. So voluntary taxation wasn't working very well. Uh, Congress also couldn't regulate interstate trade, meaning that various states could enact trade barriers, tariffs, taxes against other states. Uh, there was no national judiciary. There was no uh, national currency. And, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, but I think maybe the, the hardest thing uh, about the articles in terms of the way that they operated is they didn't just have these limits, but it was hard to change them. So in order to pass any law of real substance, it required a supermajority. It required nine of the 13 states. And in order to amend the articles, it required all 13 states. So in order to actually tax, it would have required uh, an amendment or an, a change to the articles. It would have required all 13 states. And at one point they had actually reached that almost, they had gotten to the 12 states to agree that there, there should be the power to tax from the national government. There was one holdout, the state of Rhode Island. And we'll see in this and in the next series of lectures that Rhode Island is often uh, the odd state out uh, in, in these various situations. Um, so, so the national government might have been weak, but I think the thing that might be the most important thing to, to emphasize for this period is that the states were incredibly strong. So the problem in some respects, uh, from, the, from the perspective of, of uh, certainly uh, the framers of the Constitution and people that wanted to change the national government, is not that the articles were too weak, they were actually too strong, again, at the state level. We should point out some of the accomplishments of the articles. Uh, you see here uh, the basic grid pattern uh, for new territories that was established by the Land Ordinance of 1785. This was actually the legislation of Thomas Jefferson, who served uh, quite briefly in the Confederation Congress, but he left an important impact. Uh, this set up the principle that Western territories would be divided in a very rational way, a hyper-rational way, where an, you know, an acre of land would, would cost a dollar, uh, and, and whereby new territories would actually become new states. And so the United States decided that there would be parity between those original 13 states and future states. And that was significant that, you know, I think in the minds of the found founders, they often used the word empire to describe what they were doing. But there wouldn't be a typical empire in the sense of those eastern states having uh, western colonies. Although historians are quick to point out that uh, the way that uh, the states treated uh, different groups, particularly Native Americans, was uh, you know, very close to systems of colonialism that had existed uh, since Columbus in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so eventually this expanded the, Lord, the land ordinance of 1785. In 1787, uh, the principles of it were applied to the Northwest Territory. Uh, this, this is the states of the original Big Ten before they were corrupted by 
Rutgers and, and Maryland. Uh, this is the, you know, states like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. And it laid out the plan by where, whereby they would be settled. And most significantly, it was established that there wouldn't be slavery in those territories. And that's something that we'll be talking more about in the context of the Constitution. So the way that we think about it, most people you know, must have understood that there needed to be a stronger national government, that there had to be a new system, there had to be a constitution. But in actuality, much like American independence, if there was a Gallup poll at the time, the majority of the people uh, most likely would have supported the idea of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, people were very fond of their state governments. And this is something that we can sometimes uh, easily forget. And so one thing historians have done, have, has de they've divided uh, different people from the time into two different camps. Uh, those who were nationalists, uh, historians have often referred to these, this group as the cosmopolitans or the cosmos. Uh, and the other group would be the localists um, or the locos, um, the crazies. That's not an intentional uh, name that, <laughs> that the historians used. Um, and when we think about these two groups, there's important differences. The nationalists, people like Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, James Madison, these are people for the most part that had experience in the national government during the Revolutionary War, um, either in the Continental Army or in Congress. Um, so they really experienced the, the difficulty of the Articles of Confederation at the most essential time during war. Uh, those people who were localists, and the example I give here is Patrick Henry, he's kind of the quintessential localist. He spent a short amount of time in the Virginia militia, but he spent all his time during the revolution in state government. And so those people didn't see a lot of problem with the articles. They were quite happy with having state sovereignty and, and really claiming you know, what the colonies uh, thought they had all along in their relationship with Great Britain. And so this was the big struggle, I think, that took place in the, in the 1780s uh, during the period of the Articles of Confederation, and as we'll talk about in the next lecture, in the battle between the, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists uh, over the Constitution. So let's take a look at some actual states and what was happening. Uh, the states were an amazing uh, site of experimentation. Uh, all of the new Republican ideas that were swirling in the air, uh, they were tested in the states. The states were the laboratories. And it's very telling that the most popular book at the Constitutional Confederation was a little pocket book that actually contained all the existing state constitutions. So they were very influential in shaping the, the capital C uh, Constitution. Um, so Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 is incredibly important. Uh, the U.S. Constitution is often cited as the longest running written uh, constitutional document in the world. Um, that's true for a country, but in terms of the longest running constitutional document, that would be the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, which hasn't changed um, or hasn't changed its basic foundation since that era. So the big idea that it introduced would, would be one of America's big ideas really for the world and for constitutional development in general. And that was that the people would have to approve any new form of government, not the sitting government that created the change. Um, so it's a distinction that's very important and it gave some truth to the idea of popular sovereignty, the idea that the people would rule. So Massachusetts had popular ratifying conventions. And um, as we'll read, uh, these weren't free of corruption. Uh, they weren't perfect. Uh, but the idea would, would certainly live on, and it, was, it would be something that would be adopted by the US Constitution. Uh, the image that we see right here is of the Pennsylvania State Constitution. Um, in many ways, it was the most radical document of the time. It didn't have a single executive like most other states. Uh, it had a, had a unicameral assembly and a plural executive of 12 men, uh, one of whom 
would be called president. Um, and it was kind of a rotating uh, distinction. Pennsylvania also introduced something that was very close to universal white male suffrage. And the, the first new state to come into the Union, which would be Vermont in 1791, actually started out with that uh, rule, with that um, suffrage uh, system. Uh, and so the influence of Pennsylvania as other states, I think, was incredibly uh, important. The Pennsylvania model was somewhat unstable. Uh, it was perhaps too democratic. It was so democratic that any big decisions went to referendum. Uh, so there was constant voting uh, taking place. But again, this is part of that experiment. Um, another notable state constitution was Virginia. Um, Virginia had the strongest early uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, this was written by George Mason, and this would become a model um, for the, the Declaration of Independence and for the U.S. Bill of Rights. And it was one reason, as we'll discuss, that George Mason decided not to support the original Constitution because it didn't have a, a, bill, a bill of Rights. So in each of these states, voting expanded. So did the number of legislators and the, and the number of elections. So overall, there's a fair argument to be made that this is maybe one of our most democratic periods of American history in terms of just common people governing. A lot of the elite types that might have served in the colonial governments of the era uh, were turned out of office and you know, regular farmers, artisans, uh, shopkeepers, uh, they were the types that were running the show in the states. And again, this was a little bit troubling to the elites of the era. So a typical person uh, that was a state legislator in this, in this time, typical but extraordinary in his own way, uh, is this gentleman, William Finley. Uh, William Finley uh, served in the Pennsylvania uh, State Assembly. Uh, he was a Scots-Irishman. Uh, that means that uh, his, his family came from Northern Ireland, Ireland the, the Protestant part of Ireland. Um, in 1763, there was a lot of migration from Northern Ireland in that period. Uh, he came at the age of 22. And much like Thomas Paine, he hadn't been a great success uh, up to that point. He had tried his hand at different jobs, at, uh, at weaving, at being a farmer. He tried to be a teacher. Uh, we know that's difficult. He didn't pull that one off. Uh, and so he was really kind of fumbling until the revolution came along and he really found a cause. And he is, you know, something close to a permanent uh, politician of this era. He was a militia captain and then an office holder during the revolution. So he had a common background. And Finley was significant because he openly challenged the notion of disinterested political behavior. Um, this is something that was very important to the founders. I've talked about it in the context of George Washington, but it was a real important principle of the, of the founding era, and that is that people would not act openly in their self-interest. They, they would act for the common good. And Finley said, well, you say you're acting for the common good and that you're disinterested, but your behavior actually supports elite causes. And so Finley was very open by the fact that he practiced a self-interested form of politics. He supported uh, paper money, the, the printing of money, and this was a common thing in the different states. Uh, the printing of money helped the debtor class. Um, it hurt uh, the creditor class. Uh, he and others like him supported uh, laws that were called stay laws. Uh, a stay law meant that there was a pause on the collection of debts. So again, uh, a measure that was meant to help debtors in this time in which it seemed like everybody uh, was in debt. Uh, they passed various tax holidays um, in this era. Um, so all of these things together really did benefit common people. And in some ways, this was the, the political theory that elites had espoused. They, this is why they didn't want to give the vote to people that didn't own enough property, because they thought that those people would vote for themselves, 
right? They would pursue their self-interest. Well, today we celebrate this idea as democracy. This is interest group politics, which dominates our, our politics um, today. Uh, and so really, Finley was ahead of his time. And, and that's one theme that I want to, to push here in the next lecture as well. That is, the people at the state level who were opposed to the Constitution, we look at them and say, oh, geez, they were back, backward. They didn't see the future. But in some ways, they actually were the future. They were acting in much more democratic ways than the people that we celebrate as, as the founders. So Finley's doing his thing in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, incidentally, he would later get elected to the House of Representatives. And in the early era of the House was the longest serving uh, member, would eventually be celebrated as the venerable uh, Finley. Uh, many people have served longer since, but he's, you know, he's an important early uh, state and national figure. So what, what's the view from Mount Vernon of all of this? Um, George Washington, uh, when we last uh, left him, uh, had resigned his commission uh, to Congress. He had gone back to his farm. He was playing out the role of the American Cincinnatus. Uh, Cincinnatus was the Roman statesman who had left the plow, gone to fight a war in order to help preserve the Roman Republic and then gone back to his farm. And that's, you know, kind of the role that Washington was playing in this society. But he was frustrated. Um, if we think of uh, different individuals as nationalists in this era, Washington was really kind of the uber nationalist. Uh, we see him uh, here in uniform, the Battle of Princeton uh, recurring image. Uh, and I, I cite this because even during the war, Washington was beginning to favor a much stronger central government. Uh, this is uh, a quote from May of 1780. He said, certain I am that unless Congress speaks in a more decisive tone, unless they are vested with powers by the several states competent to the great purposes of war, that our cause is lost. I see one head gradually changing into 13. And this was a common theme in Washington's writings throughout the 1780s. He often talks about this, this 13-headed you know, monster that was emerging in the United States that was replacing any kind of uh, you know, consolidated, unified uh, government. Uh, and so we, we looked at his uh, you know, very famous act of resigning his commission, and here's the image of that once again. Well, there's a literary equivalent of that uh, that we're reading, and it's his circular letter to the states in June of 1783. And I think it's the most important document that Washington ever wrote, and I think it's certainly the most important in showing his political philosophy. Uh, he begins by apologizing for even sharing his political views, because this is something that a general doesn't do. But then he goes on to say why he thinks there needs to be a change in government. Uh, he doesn't come out right, you know, outright and say the articles have to be uh, disbanded, but he thinks there needs to certainly be reforms. And so in that uh, document he says, unless the states will suffer Congress to exercise those prerogatives they are undoubtedly invested with by the Constitution, everything, and by the Constitution it means the articles, Everything must very rapidly tend to anarchy and confusion. That is, that, that it is indispensable to the happiness of the individual states that there should be lodged somewhere a supreme power to regulate and govern the general concerns of the Confederated Republic, without which the Union cannot be of long duration. So Washington's underrated, I think, for his political sense, and he's, he's saying, this is even bad for the states. If you care about the states, you will want some kind of, he calls it the uh, supreme power, you know, what we call sovereignty. He's saying there needs to be one place that's, that's sovereign. And so he's almost arguing for something like what had existed under the British model, except rather than a parliament being sovereign, Congress would be sovereign. 
He also had a lot of private concerns that he expressed in you know, different letters, some of which we will read during the 1780s. And he had commercial concerns. Now, this is an image of the Great Falls of the Potomac. And for those of you that haven't uh, been to the Washington, D.C. area or haven't spent a lot of time there, uh, unbelievably, there are actually true waterfalls uh, about 15 uh, miles or so north of, of the center of the city. Uh, and, you know, it's not Niagara Falls, but it's, it's pretty dramatic. And it's important because Washington had an early case of today what's called Potomac Fever. Potomac Fever today is, you know, the excitement of being in D.C. and seeking power and exercising that power and, you know, kind of being, being in the swamp. Well, for Washington, Potomac Fever was uh, an absolute infatuation with this river and a perhaps delusional estimation of its commercial promise. Uh, he thought that the Potomac was the key to the country's development, that it had the ability to link eastern areas with western areas and, and really kind of imagine that those western areas uh, might grow food, allowing for more manufacturers in the east. So he was wrong about the waterway, but his vision was correct. That's basically what happened with the Erie Canal uh, by the 1820s. Well, in his first retirement in the 1780s, Washington became the president of the Potomac Company, uh, a, a company that was you know, formed to really develop this commercial potential of the river. And among its problems, it had to build canals to get around these falls. Um, but it also ran into political problems. It ran into the problem that it wasn't clear what state actually regulated the Potomac. In their original charters from England, uh, the states of Virginia and Maryland uh, got really kind of different instructions. Uh, in the Maryland instructions, uh, it's clear that they controlled the water of the Potomac. For Virginia, they controlled the land that was connected to the, to the river. And so it wasn't a neat division. It wasn't drawing a line in the middle of the river. It was really shared. And, and so this posed a problem in, in developing it because they had to get both Virginia and Maryland to be on board. And so uh, Washington actually hosted a conference at Mount Vernon in 1785. He brought legislators from both states together in order to iron out this problem. And this is the first of several examples of the nationalists going around the limits of the articles in order to solve different problems. Well, an event that came along the following fall, the fall of 1786, was Shays' Rebellion. Uh, we don't have a good image of Daniel Shays. Uh, this is the best uh, that we have, this, this uh, book uh, print that you see in this particular slide. Daniel Shays uh, to the left and his uh, his partner, uh, Job Shattuck, to the right. Um, Shays was a Continental Army veteran in Massachusetts who, like most people, was in debt. And he was concerned that, that both he and his neighbors were at risk of losing their farms. And Massachusetts was one of the few states that didn't print a lot of money, that didn't pass the stay laws, uh, they had a pretty conservative uh, fiscal uh, policy in, in Massachusetts. And so there was a lot of pressure on the lower classes. And so Shays actually re led, led a, a rebellion uh, aimed at keeping the courts from functioning. So he actually stormed various courthouses. And this is a time, you know, they didn't have electronic records or duplicate records of a lot of things. If, if he could get a hold of the records of the various you know, debts and, and property records and whatnot, the idea was he couldn't be uh, foreclosed. And so this was seen as a, a great threat to order and stability after the revolution. At its very height, the, you know, Shays' group, which called itself the Regulators, might have had about 2,000 people. It was inflated in the Eastern press to be as high as 20 and even 40,000 men that were part of this group. And so, as, jo as Washington was reading these reports, you know, he couldn't believe it. 
And so Shea's Rebellion is very important in the coming of the Constitutional Convention. And this is just a list of different events. I mentioned uh, the Mount Vernon Conference, 1785. That was followed in 1786 by another convention, a, a gathering of states, the Annapolis Convention. Only five states attended that convention. And Alexander Hamilton was one of the key figures in putting that together. Um, like the First Continental Congress, the Annapolis Convention made an important decision, and that was to meet again. They decided there would be another meeting the following spring of 1787, and that became the Philadelphia Convention, um, the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and in the midst of all this, as I mentioned, Shays' Rebellion took place. And so it was really reinforcing the need for um, change. Uh, because among other things, the rebellion was very hard, it was very hard to put down. It was hard to get the militia from the different states to cooperate until they finally did in early 1787. So this is just a, a snapshot of what was happening under the Articles. I want to shift now to the actual planning for the Constitutional Convention because uh, you know, I mentioned in the, at Annapolis in September they disbanded so there was going to be the winter of 1786-1787 before the meeting in, in the spring of 1787 in Philadelphia. And during that period, it was really the chance for James Madison to take his star turn in American history. Uh, we talked about Madison early in the course. Uh, he was a student at Princeton uh, who was perhaps overly diligent, uh, stayed on, became the college's first graduate student because he didn't leave. And so this was a perfect opportunity for him. Um, incredibly studious, he decided to spend that winter basically becoming an expert on the history of republics in the world. Because one thing the American founders knew was that every republic had failed. And so Madison's big question was why? Why did the various republics fail? And he was helped by uh, Thomas Jefferson, who sent Madison two trunks full of books uh, from Europe in order to explore this problem. And I'm going to talk more about the solution in, in terms of the contest between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, because Madison doesn't really come up with a full solution, and I think, until he writes the, the Federalist Papers. But he diagnoses the problem, and the problem for him is what he called the tyranny of the majority. The problem in a Republican system, it's rather ironic in this representative system that's built on certain democratic principles, um, it can actually end up hurting the minority. And in his mind, the minority in this era were the creditors. The creditors were being hurt by the debtors and by the people that represented the debtors, uh, people like William Finley in Pennsylvania or in outside of politics like Daniel Shays in Massachusetts. And so one thing that Madison knew needed to happen is there had to be a stronger central government, that, that, that there had to be power taken from the states in order to keep these, these various factions at the state level uh, from, you know, in his mind, really running the country into the ground. Uh, even though, you know, he certainly had the interest of property in mind, um, I think the ideas of Charles Beard from the Progressive Era, he wrote a you know, great book, famous book, The Economic Interpretation of the Constitution, in which he basically said the Constitution was, was written by these elites in order to protect their own property, uh, their own um, well-being, their self-interest. Uh, and, and I think we just kind of take that for granted, like, well, yes, that is true. Uh, they did do that. But if you read the writings of Madison and the other founders, uh, they're also talking about just saving the republic, uh, saving the country uh, from, you know, what they thought was anarchy and, and chaos. And so I think both things can certainly be true. So Madison is a critical figure. The other really critical figure here is George Washington. Washington uh, almost didn't attend the Constitutional Convention. And it's related to this image that you see here. That diamond eagle is what uh, the different presidents of the Society of the Cincinnati um, wear. The Society of the Cincinnati was a fraternal organization 
uh, that was founded after the revolution by Henry Knox and some of Washington's other officers. Uh, they asked him to be the president and it was a well-meaning organization. Uh, it was intended to keep the various uh, you know, men from the war to, in, in contact. Uh, they were supposed to help each other and help each other's families. But they created a curious membership rule. The membership rule was that uh, after the original officers passed, the oldest son of the next generation would become a member of the society. And that's the only person from, uh, you know, a particular family. Well, this sounded an awful lot like aristocracy. It sounded an awful lot like, like primogeniture, that system by which the eldest son inherited everything. And these are the systems that America had rejected in, in, in uh, fighting the Revolutionary War. Um, so this was a, something of a public relations crisis for Washington because he had agreed to become the president of this society of the Cincinnati. Uh, and he had encouraged them to get rid of this hereditary membership rule. Well, the various state chapters rejected that. There's 13 state chapters plus one in France, so 14 altogether. It still exists today, and it still has the same membership uh, rules today. Um, but it, you know, it was soon discovered that, that this wasn't a group that was trying to take over the country or anything. It had a very benign purpose. But Washington still wanted to distance himself from it. Uh, he agreed to a three-year presidential term in 1784. It was going to come up in 1787. And sure enough, the society was going to meet in Philadelphia in May of 1787, the exact same time that this convention had been called uh, to discuss the future government of the country. And Washington had told his you know, people that he called his family, people like Knox, that he could not be in Philadelphia in May of 1787, that he wasn't feeling well, that he had some things to fix around Mount Vernon. Um, it's very rare to catch Washington in a lie, but this is one of those cases. And he knew it. And so when Madison and later Hamilton and uh, people like Gouverneur Morris were encouraging him to attend the Philadelphia Convention, he tried to say no. Uh, until they finally convinced him to go. And so he went, and sure enough, he was reelected the, as the um, uh, president of the Society of Cincinnati. That was a job he would have until the end of his life. Uh, after Washington died in 1799, Alexander Hamilton became the second president of the Society of Cincinnati. Um, so, so he did that, but he, he got to Philadelphia, which is the main thing. Uh, the Constitution wouldn't have succeeded without him, he was the most well-regarded uh, and most trusted person in the country for giving up power at the end of the Revolutionary War. So in total, there were 55 delegates from 12 states that met in Pennsylvania between May uh, 1787 and, and September 1787. Uh, there was never that many all at one time, usually, usually, usually around 40 or so. Uh, they met in this uh, famous room in Independence Hall, the, the Assembly Room. And I think what's really critical in looking at the Constitutional Convention is to emphasize the amount of compromise that took place. That they didn't have it all figured out. It wasn't all in the bag, and it definitely wasn't inevitable. It's a great model, I think, for our politics today and the, and the need uh, and, the, and the potential benefits for compromise. Well, Madison came in with his plan, which uh, was called the Virginia Plan, and was introduced by Governor Edmund Randolph on May 29th, 1787. Uh, Randolph introduced the plan, and I'm just going to give a few of the highlights. Um, the most important part of it was that it created an extremely strong national government under Congress. This was a government that uh, was apportioned, uh, the, the, the representatives were apportioned by population in both branches of the legislature, the upper branch and the lower branch. This was to the benefit of a large state like Virginia. And this very powerful legislature uh, could not only tax and regulate trade, it could actually veto the laws of the various states. If, if it decided a law was not 
correct. Um, so this, this was very offensive to small states. Uh, and it looked a lot like the British Parliament, that Madison was creating a parliament for America. Um, now one reason I'm going to spend some time on these different plans is that this is what mattered the most to these people. Well, I'll talk a little bit in the end about the presidency and the issue of slavery, which I think is, might be something that matters the most to us right now. But to them, they spent weeks trying to figure this out. So the Virginia plan you know, was the first one on the table. That was followed by the Virginia plan, or the small state plan, that was introduced by William Patterson, um, who later became a justice on the Supreme Court. And Patterson, uh, in introducing this plan, which became known as the small state plan or the New Jersey plan, uh, basically introdu introduced a plan that was, it was a little bit of a beefed up version of the Articles of Confederation. It maintained the principle of one state, one vote, which um, you know, was a, an advantage for small states, but it gave Congress the power to tax. So it sought to give some credibility uh, to really maintaining the status quo. Uh, what's kind of funny about it is that tax that it, could, that it could use was a stamp tax or a tax on various duties. So in essence, the New Jersey plan was adopting a British taxation scheme. And again, it, I think it showed a lack of an imagination at this point. The Americans didn't quite know what to do. Well, someone in the convention was sitting and feeling very restless uh, during this whole presentation by the, by the smaller states. I uh, was incredibly frustrated, and I can imagine him just fuming. And that person was none other than Alexander Hamilton. In the musical Hamilton, it mentions that he gave a six-hour speech at the Constitutional Convention. It doesn't mention what he actually talked about. Uh, Hamilton introduced his own plan for the future of the United States government. And he was really an unapologetic admirer of the British system. And, and so if, if Madison had introduced a parliament for America, and if New Jersey had introduced a British tax scheme for America, uh, Hamilton really introduced the whole British Constitution. He introduced a system by which the President and the Senate would serve for life. Uh, and he thought that this was very important to create stability in this new national government. Uh, Madison's notes uh, from the convention are our are, are best and in some cases our only source for what happened. And he wrote this um, of, of Hamilton. Madison wrote, in his private opinion, he had no scruple in declaring that the British government was the best in the world and that he doubted much whether anything short of it uh, would do in America. Uh, and so these very first principles we talked about, Anglicization versus Americanization, you can see those at play right here. And, and uh, Hamilton's certainly a, an advocate for Anglicization. So, Hamilton's speech, in turn, upset another member of the, the small, date, small state delegation, and that was a guy, great name, Gunning Bedford, a small state man from uh, Delaware, who said this. He said, the large states dare not dissolve the Confederation. If they do, the small ones will find some foreign ally of more honor and good faith who will take them by the hand and, and do them justice. Uh, so it looked like the whole United States was going to, you know, coming apart at the seams here. Uh, the small states are threatening to, to walk out. And it was at this moment that the Connecticut Compromise, known as the Great Compromise in American history, was forged. And it was done by Connecticut, by uh, politicians including uh, Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth. And we, we look back, we use that historian's superpower of hindsight, and it seems obvious that they, all they needed to do was split the difference between the large state plan and the small state plan. Um, you know, a portion representation by population in the lower house, uh, the lower legislative branch, what would become the House of Representatives, and give equal votes to the states in the upper house, what became the Senate. But in reality, this was incredibly difficult to forge. And I'll give you an example of this. It didn't make George Washington very happy. He wrote to Alexander Hamilton, who had left the convention, 
Uh, and, and, and he explained what was happening. And Washington said, in a word, I almost despair of seeing a favorable issue to the proceedings of the convention and do therefore repent having had any agency in the business. So Washington's words can be kind of hard to understand, but the 21st century translation, I think, is I shouldn't even have come. I wasn't going to come. They, they convinced me to come, but it was a mistake because this is what is taking place. And so this is what we celebrate, right? We celebrate this compromise today, but it's important to recognize that at the time, uh, it was hard. It was so hard that Washington felt like walking out of the convention. Fortunately, he stayed. And, and so in the last weeks of the convention, the delegates could turn to other matters. And, and so very briefly, I want to just kind of discuss what the convention did with the issue of slavery and, and how it formed the presidency. In terms of the issue of, of slavery, uh, the Constitution protected it legally, but it never actually used the word. And in his notes, Madison acknowledged that. He wrote that um, it would be wrong to admit in the Constitution the idea that there could be property in men. So again, the founders were embarrassed uh, by this you know, central fact of, of, that, of their era. Uh, but they, they did write slavery in the Constitution and the three, three-fifths compromise uh, in Article I. It shows up in the Fugitive Slave Clause later. It shows up in the fact that the uh, Atlantic slave trade could not be banned until 1808. Uh, that was one of the, the provisions of the original um, Constitution. And so again, the, the founders really thought that this was something that should be solved at the state level, um, which in fairness was happening, albeit slowly, with the process of gradual emancipation. Well, there's an interesting thing that was happening. Um, we'll go back to the map of the, the, the new Northwest Territory. Um, we talked about how the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 was one of the accomplishments of the Confederation Congress. Well, that was coming together just as the Constitution was being framed. That was happening in New York while the Constitutional Convention was meeting in Philadelphia. And so historians have speculated that there had to be a knowledge of what was happening in each place. That in New York, they were banning slavery on uh, these new northern territories. And in Philadelphia, they were keeping it legal uh, in, the, in the rest of the, the Union. Um, and so this is known as the, the Compromise of 1787. And we don't have the smoking gun where there was some kind of deal, uh, but there's several delegates to the Philadelphia Convention that also served in Congress. So there's a lot of movement back and forth, and it seems almost inconceivable that they didn't have an idea of what was happening. Um, so I'll put this map up here again. Uh, a legacy of the founding era is this division between free and slave labor, which would eventually result in, in the Civil War. And I think it probably had a better chance of being solved in the Continental Congress than it did by the time of the, of the Constitutional Convention. That, you know, the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, which we read in this course, Thomas Jefferson has his tirade against George III and the slave trade. Um, that shows that there was some momentum at the time to maybe abolish slavery. Uh, that had mostly gone away by the time of the Constitution. So the other big issue that had to be solved was the executive. There was no executive uh, under the Articles of Confederation. And it's pretty amazing that the Constitution created such a strong executive in Article II. And a lot of the thinking about this is that it had a lot to do with George Washington. The fact that George Washington was the president of the Constitutional Convention that he sort of oversaw the different meetings and for that reason didn't talk until the very end of the convention. He didn't want to participate in debates uh, even though everyone knew he was with the Nationalists, he was with Madison. Uh, everyone thought that he would be the first president and, and that's part of the reason why the office is so strong. Um, think for a second about the superpowers of the President of the United States the legal ones, the ones that are constitutional, uh, they're pretty significant. They include being commander-in-chief of U.S. forces, they include the ability to pardon, 
They include the ability to veto uh, a bill from Congress. If you're like me, a fan of Schoolhouse Rock, you know this is a very important <laughs> power that Bill has to work so hard to go up the steps of Capitol Hill and then the president can just kick him, kick him down. Uh, well, there was only one other person on the planet that had these powers at this time, and that was King George, King George III in England, which was a constitutional monarchy, except especially the veto was seen as uh, a very controversial power, that it was something a monarch shouldn't use. And it was used almost never um, until George became king. He actually tried to use a veto in the 1790s. Sure enough, it caused a constitutional crisis in England. George Washington had two vetoes during his presidency. So I think it shows that they're giving the American president, you know, kingly, monarchical, uh, powers for the era and and this is certainly something that you know subsequent generations would live with and I think it's an important issue um, in in American society and politics today and that is um, has the executive become too strong so we'll close uh, on, a, on a happy note in terms of the convention because this convention could have gone wrong many different times and as I've emphasized, it was through the, the power of compromise and del deliberation that they came up with an effective working government. So they got to the very end, and Madison recorded something that uh, Benjamin Franklin said while staring, while staring at this chair, the chair that George Washington sat in. Franklin said, I have often looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting. But now I know it is a rising sun. And so Franklin and the other delegates, uh, for the most part, felt pretty good about what had happened. They realized that they had come a long ways, but they still had a lot of humility. They realized that not all the problems had been solved. Uh, but when we look at it, they had, you know, they, I think they did have good reason to feel good. Uh, and the main reason is they had solved what might have been the most difficult political problem of this era. It went all the way back to the colonial period, and that was the issue of sovereignty and how to integrate different territories into a common political system. This is something the British couldn't figure out after the Seven Years' War when they gained Canada. They couldn't find a way to give political representation to their colonies. And, and so the Americans did this with the Constitution with a system that we call federalism, the sharing of powers at the uh, national and state level. And they also figured out the problem with sovereignty. That sovereignty didn't have to be in just one place. It didn't have to be located in just one legislature like Parliament, or you didn't have to have 13 separate republics like the Articles of Confederation cr created. Um, the people could be sovereign. And in turn, they could delegate that uh, sovereignty, that authority, to their elected representatives, both at the state and the national level. So it wasn't perfect. Uh, there's a few good, uh, you know, I think a few good stories that show the difficulty that remained. Uh, if you look at a newspaper from this period and read it, it will say the United States are emphasizing the plural, even though the point of the Constitution was to create a unified single national government and system. It took until the Civil War for that small grammatical change to take place, that small but powerful one. If you look at a newspaper after the, the Civil War, it should say, unless it makes a mistake, the United States is um, emphasizing the singular. The other story uh, we've already heard in the context of um, our lecture about women in the Revolutionary Era. Benjamin Franklin, after talking about that rising sun, left these doors, you know, that left the building uh, that was the Pennsylvania State House. Uh, met Elizabeth Willing Powell on the street, not just some random woman, but Elizabeth Willing Powell, and she asked him whether they had created a republic or a monarchy, and of course he said, a republic if you can keep it. And again, I think this shows that the founders had something very specific in mind. They were creating a system that would, that would um, require an educated and vigilant and active uh, citizenry in order to thrive. 
Uh, and so for all the uh, educators and other public servants out there, and just plain voters, um, uh, thank you for doing your job. And this is something that all of us that live in a republic have to take seriously.